Okay, now it's my pleasure to introduce the Marianne Rothbard Memorial Lecture, sponsored by Stephen and Cassandra Torello. Michael Oliver entered the financial services industry in 1975. In the 1980s, Mike began to develop his own momentum-based method of technical analysis, Momentum Structural Analysis, or MSA. Has received glowing reviews, including ones from Bill Fleckenstein, a well-known market analyst, financial author, and hedge fund manager, and Dr. Gary Schlarbaum, longtime supporter of the Mises Institute. In December 2015, the Wall Street Journal wrote, MSA looks at the market from a somewhat different point of view. Rather than focusing on price, something that virtually everybody does, MSA tracks momentum, revealing trends that have been building for a long time and have much more depth to them and staying power, unquote. Mr. Oliver is the author of The New Libertarianism, Anarcho-Capitalism, A Marriage of Concepts of Ayn Rand and Murray Rothbard, written in 1972 and published in 2013. I also want to add that um, Mike Oliver was the editor of the most radical, or probably the most radical libertarian um, newsletter um, in 1972 called The New Banner. There's only six issues, but they were wonderful. And they uh, include a, one, a wonderful interview with Murray Rothbard, a very revealing and, and um, passionate interview. Um, Doc, Mr. Oliver will address us on two topics. We get two for one. Knowing Murray in the early years and why Rothbard and Rand would relish 2024, beginning collapse of statism and the, its realities. Thank you. Nobody covered it in the intro. I had to cut some stuff out of what I was going to talk about. <laughs> anyway, thanks, uh, thanks to Joe Salerno and the Mises Institute for inviting me to speak. Uh, before I begin, I want you to know that I've not given a talk about libertarianism on that subject to an audience since 1971, and the audience size was about six. Okay, <laughs> uh, and because it's so unusual for me to do this uh, on this subject matter. My family came with me from Colorado, my wife Janet, my son Lauren, a filmmaker, my son Brett, who's the other half of Momentum Structural Analysis. Anyway, they, they wanted to see what I did. <laughs> uh, anyway, relax today, put your pens away. There's no academics in my discussion. Uh, it's going to be, first part will be simply personal recollections. Therefore, it'll be from my eyes, so it seems very egoistic. But that's the way I saw it. I saw Murray Rothbard in the very early years of what then wasn't even the libertarian movement. It was hardly a thing you could call the movement. Uh, in the second half, I'll be talking about what's coming in the next year. Uh, I think that's a well-timed statement. Uh, I think it's going to be a crescendo year, uh, not just in terms of uh, the markets, which is what I analyze, but in a lot of institutions that don't belong here, that are based on illegitimate, and concepts that ultimately had to decay. Uh, I'm not a sports fan, but I think what you're about to see over the next 12 months and maybe even sooner is going to be the best football game you've ever seen. Uh, cheer, okay? That is if you're intellectually and personally prepared for that emergent reality. Now for a look back through my own experiences at the early days of the infant libertarian movement. Consider this like looking over my shoulder into a scrapbook. In fact, we'll, we'll see some, some points up here on the screen later. Uh, my intellectual context personally is similar to some others here, I know, because I've, I've read their bios. Uh, but in 1965, 66, I was in high school in Cincinnati, and I was a member of a popular conservative group then called YAF, Young Americans for Freedom. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Libertarianism, to some extent, among youth anyway, emerged from that conservative movement at, at points in time. I was the youngest yaffer in Cincinnati, and one of the older adult members, I think he was a lawyer at the time, said, have you ever read Ayn Rand? And I, I had not. And he recommended that I, I do so. Uh, I began the very lazy way of doing it. I read Anthem, the smallest, you know, thinnest novel. Okay. And then I worked my way up uh, through We the Living, Fountainhead, and Atlas Shrugged, and later her philosophical works. It was also interesting to me at that time because my first knowledge at all 
of von Mises or the Austrian school came through Ayn Rand. This is in a copy of The Objectivist. This is dated 1970. You could have gone back earlier years, but you'll notice there's a review of the omnipotent government there. And believe me, it was highly favorable. And you go to the last page of The Objectivist and in her bookstore, there she is selling that particular book. Most of Mises' work were available through the Ayn Rand bookstore, which was a mail order bookstore. But she definitely promoted him. And you've got to realize, I, I think this is a correct observation, that given the enormous size of Rand's audience, I mean, because of her novels and the movie Fountainhead and so forth, which was huge, uh, it, no doubt she very likely advanced the Austrian school of economics in terms of its public awareness of it more than probably anybody else out there. So she had, to some extent, a, a, probably an impact on the Mises Institute even being here today. Um, in 1970, I finished a bachelor's degree at Furman University in South Carolina, and I moved to Columbia, South Carolina, the capital. And I began a master's thesis in political philosophy at University of South Carolina. Again, I'm not talking about me. I'm just talking about how things I saw things at that point in time. In Columbia, I bumped into a couple other objectivists. And it was a fairly sizable city in South Carolina. And I, I bumped into two. And believe me, that's about all there were. There were also emergent libertarians. Uh, and we started a newspaper then called The New Banner. Uh, you will see it in a second here, uh, which was the nation's first anarcho-capitalist slash objectivist newspaper. We published it in 1972. It began in 71, but published in 72. And at its peak, it had 200 subscribers nationwide. Now, don't laugh. That was a huge number given the size of the libert what was the libertarian movement in 1972. It was also in late 71, I began working on my master's thesis on anarcho-capitalism. And so naturally, I communicated with Murray Rothbard. In July 1971, I'm going to tell you the date for a reason. July 30th, 1971, I wrote a letter to Rothbard, in which I explained I was writing a thesis entitled Anarcho-Capitalism, and I wanted his permission to quote from his works in that, in that writing. And I said that one of the reasons was that I would later publish it, and I, therefore I needed his permission to quote him. Uh, he responded, now look at the date on the letter. Three days after I wrote and mailed the letter, he responded. Again, it's a postal service, okay? Got to New York City from Columbia, South Carolina. Now, I'm not, this is not my ego trip for me. This is a statement about the obvious. Uh, if Sherlock Holmes were here, he would look at that and say, there's no doubt that he deduces that Murray Rothbard was very, very eager to encourage and to help emergent libertarian academicians. So eager that he stopped everything he was doing to reply three days later. I'll, I'll quote from the letter. It's hard to see it, but uh, parts of it. It says, always a pleasure to find anarcho-capitalists who are scholars. And this is far rarer and more important than people who are merely anarchists. Y you have my permission to quote from any and all my stuff. There have been a couple of projected graduate theses on libertarianism, but they've either dropped out or hopeless. So yours is the first projected thesis on the subject. If you have any questions on the subject or on my views, please feel free to write or to ask me in person. Well, I was flattered. Uh, with New Banner, uh, a friend of mine and I, with New Banner, Don Stone, we drove to New York City in January. Rothbard was willing to be interviewed by New Banner. I interviewed him in mid-January. And um, it was a very delightful four hours that we spent in his residence. Now, if, if you're familiar with New York, uh, I'll tell you where it was. It was West 88th, one block from the intersection of Broadway. So if you live there, go visit that street and you'll see it. <laughs> West 88th Street. Uh, anyway, we also met Joey, his wife at that time. We were in his, his home, his residence. And she was as cheery as Murray. Uh, and it picks in, uh, anyway, let's go to the New Banner interview here. And uh, here's some pictures of him during the interview. You'll notice he has a Recording. We recorded the interview, and uh, Clay upstairs there uh, has been good to try to resurrect the entire interview in audio form, 
and I think it'll be available to the Mises Institute once he does. But again, this is 72, you know. Um, anyway, go. David Nolan is forming a libertarian political party. Its membership has indicated an interest in nominating you for its presidential candidate in 1972. What is your response to this overture? <laughs> Right. I I told them when they asked me, they found me out for a bit. Uh, they, uh, I I told them I want to be the Emmy Nobs Grease and the uh, and the president. <laughs> And I'm the White House aide of the president. I think, yeah, I, think, I guess the humor is in. No, I, I really don't think so. I mean, um, as lovable as third parties are, libertarian, the idea of a libertarian party sounds, of course, uh, sounds great, but I, I really don't think that uh, at this stage of our development that it's sitting here you on know, anything but foolhardy. Uh, to have a libertarian party, there's just not that many libertarians yet. <laughs> I mean, there's no finances, there's no people, there's no nothing. So I, I really don't, um, maybe eventually we will have a libertarian party. What would be the purpose of a libertarian party? What would be the goal of a libertarian party? Well, I think we, uh, if there were a libertarian party, I mean, I find that, I said, I'm difficult to talk about this. I don't want to make it seem as if I think this is a realistic thing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if there ever were a strong libertarian party, there could be several things. Uh, Practically, we can have a balance of power, I would say. You know, you can have uh, maybe an electoral college or something like that. Uh, even better, I mean, is an educational weapon would be very good, I think, because, uh, you know, if you have if you had 10 guys in Congress, let's say, each of whom are constantly agitating for libertarian purposes, voting against the budget, let's say, you know, I think it would be very useful. Um, and also, uh, see, one of the, I mean, we have a long range problem, which is really a problem which Strategically, nobody, none of us have really ever tackled, grappled with to any extent. And that is, how do we get, and how do we finally establish the libertarian system of radical capitalism? Uh, now obviously, ideas are the key thing. First, you have to start off, you have to persuade uh, a lot of people to be anarchists or anarcho capitalists. Uh, but then what? In other words, what's the next step? Uh, we certainly don't have to convince the majority of the public, perhaps, because most of the public will sort of follow anything that goes to happen. We have to obviously have to have a large minority, but then in other words, how do we then implement this? And I think this this is a sort of the power problem because, uh, as I've expressed in other places, uh, the government's not going to resign. In other words, you're not going to have a situation where Dick Nixon reads Human Action or, or uh, a shrug or many kind of things. Because my God, they're right. I'm <laughs> It's not going to have to be great at the time. I'm not saying, I'm not denying the philosophical possibility this might happen, but obviously strategically it's very low on the probability scale. But as the Marxists put it, no ruling class has ever voluntarily surrendered its power. So in other words, it has to be, we have to deal with the problem how to get these guys off our back. Uh, and I think a party, it seems to me, one of the few ways of doing it in the long run, in the sense that if you get, if you really have a dedicated group of, in Congress or in the Senate or whatever, we can start voting measures down or, you know, whatever. But I don't think this is the only way. I think maybe eventually there'll be civil disobedience where the, the public will start not paying taxes and things like that. But uh, in other words, they're, they're, if you look at it, as, uh, dismantling the state, there are several possible alternatives. There's violent revolution, there's nonviolent civil disobedience, and there's a political action method, or the political party. I don't know which of these will be successful. It's really a... Uh, well, it's really a tactical question which you can't really predict in advance. But it seems to me it's foolhardy to give up any particular arm of this. Uh, in other words, to abandon political action, uh, political parties, because you're saying, well, of course, once you get into the political arena, you're always compromising. But it's very true. But on the other hand, what else are you going to do? I, mean, I think this is a real problem. In other words, I think it's incumbent on people to come up with some kind of strategic perspective to, to, to dismantle a state. See, for example, Bob Lafayette, somehow works it out, and it's almost impossible to get rid of the state from his own point of view. In other words, 
He's against violent revolution. Okay, that's a very respectable position. He's also against voting. He's also against political parties. Um, and it becomes very difficult to really see what, you know, what direct, how, how possibly he can get, get, get at the state at all from this kind of speech. It would have to deteriorate itself. You have to, yeah, have to wither away in some way because it's inefficient. A lot of, a lot of people were, that perspective saying, well, it's going to be inefficient and sort of die out. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen that way. You know, so, so I think, I don't see why we should give up something like political party. In other words, it might be a route eventually to, to this, dismantling the state or helping to dismantle it or combination of one, two parts. If you have, non, if you have civil disobedience on one hand and, and a, a party and a government blocking measures with suppressed civil disobedience, something like that, it seems to me. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's very hazy now, the distant future, if ever, but uh, uh, I don't see why we should, in other words, a priori, give up uh, a political party uh, or political action. Uh, if you want his interview, um, you can go to the Mises site, type in my name, and you can click on the, the, the in-print version of that. Uh, it's also a, uh, it's on Wikipedia. There's a big biography of Rothbard on Wikipedia. I don't, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's quite lengthy, more so than most people on Wikipedia. And uh, if you go to footnote 126 on this, you'll find my name, and there's a link. You can hear the, uh, see the interview in print. It's actually on lourockwell.com. It's where you're clicking. Uh, anyway. Now, when we ran New Banner, um, again, it only lasted like six issues. They were like at 10 pages each. And uh, we had a few uh, interesting outside submissions. This one is uh, from a guy named R. Cobb, who was a fairly famous cartoonist then. But if you look at the picture, I hope you can read all the, the details there. But this is, again, 1972. This guy had a foresight. Uh, he knew what the state was all about. Now, he didn't know about the Internet. Now, they do it different ways. They surveil you different ways. But uh, look at the citizens B, citizens A, citizens C, places to sit. They're being, you know, anyway. Anyway, we don't have anarchy. That's good. So uh, anyway. uh, he later on uh, became a conceptual and production designer for some major movies uh, such as, uh, let's see what we've got here, uh, Conan the Barbarian, Last Starfighter. Alien, Close Encounters of Third Kind, and Back to the Future. Um, and then uh, here was an article that we ran that later helped change my life. For the National Committee to Legalize Gold, I just want to reminisce about this because it, a single libertarian, James Blanchard III in New Orleans at that time, and this is 1972, basically ran his own campaign to legalize gold. Uh, he funded it, and he was pretty much it. Uh, but it got legalized. He lo he lobbied and, and enough he got enough votes and Gerald Ford signed it in late December '74. But uh, the fact that he legalized gold uh, got gold legalized it later changed my life and my career direction instead of academia. Uh, and then in the same uh, that same issue, the summer issue, I think it was, a guy submitted an article <coughs> on the Pledge of Allegiance, analyzing it. Uh, it was a guy named Walter Block. Uh, I didn't know him, and, uh, but we published it. It was a good article. Uh, Walter was 31 at the time. It was four years before he wrote his first book, Defending the Undefendable. Um, anyway, I, the, my only regret is that when he submitted it and, and signed you know, the letter associated with it, I didn't keep it. So I, I don't have it archived, uh, which I would love. But anyway, so much about New Banner. Uh, my last communication with Murray was several years later in 1977. I was not in academia at that point. I'd already shifted careers. But I submitted an article to him for the Libertarian Forum at that time. And um, his letter response to me was very lengthy. In fact, it's two pages. I don't know if we have them both here or not. No, could we just have one? Uh, very lengthy letter. I'll read a few parts from it because it imparts some changes that had occurred in the libertarian movement between 72 when we interviewed him and the time of this letter five years later. Great hearing from you after all this time and also to get your excellent article which will be run in the libertarian forum. It's a very good contribution to the whole defense issue as well as the important theoretical issue which libertarians have generally not faced 
on how to destatize. Uh, another part, as you know, I'm more sanguine about the libertarian, this is, gets interesting here. I'm more sanguine about the libertarian party than you are, though I must admit the Florida party is one of the most right-wing of all LPs. The Florida, Colorado, and most of the California LP tried to change the platform in a pro-war direction last week to call for military alliances with legitimate governments and to attack private terrorism. We, but we managed to, he, and the, he was active at that time in the LP, we managed to beat them back with what I thought was surprising ease, radicalizing the platform still further by defending the right of private groups to defend themselves against tyranny by calling for negotiations aimed at a general and complete disarmament down to police levels, by making individual cops rather than taxpayers liable for restitution for aggressing against private citizens. Uh, that was also part of my thesis uh, in earlier years, the issue of uh, dealing with government violence against individuals and how it, and also how would a free market have a defense system, internal defense, security, and so forth. Uh, anyway, he continues, our objective is uh, anarchists were more in control of the platform committee, and it turns out of the convention. Our objective is not to turn the LP into an outright anarchist party, but rather to make it into a genuine radical libertarian party. So far, again, to my surprise, the platform has gotten more radical and more anarchistic at each successive LP convention. He finished with a personal notice. As you can see by the letterhead, we're out here in California for a year, as I have gotten off teaching in the next, in, for the next academic year. Always a pleasure. <laughs> anyway. Uh, that was my last communication. He did, uh, in fact, run the article, and I love this isn't the article itself. This is the cover of the, ar of the issue, and I, I could, couldn't imagine a better title for the issue mine was in. Do you hate the state? I love it. God. Anyway, my article appeared in it, and I was, I'm very proud that it did. It's, uh, anyway, uh, the anarcho-capitalism is now also in Wikipedia. It's, it's cited, and there's a fairly lengthy article on it, and, of course, Rothbard is... Is the founder, uh, and I lucked up in the philosophy. To know that anarcho-capitalism is now a, a streetwise term, uh, and that there's a guy in Argentina who's named his dog after him. You know. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, now for the second part of my talk, totally, totally off the archival look back at the early libertarian movement. Um, in 19, and personally, in 1974, I was working on a PhD at University of Hawaii. Finished all my coursework. Um, and I decided uh, I was going to write a dissertation on Lysander Spooner. I was getting flagged from above, naturally. That was a nuisance, but it was to be expected in academia. Uh, but what really concerned me at that time was the global economy was entering stagflation. Uh, I, I knew it, and I also knew that new academicians were not being hired very readily. There was a tight budget in universities. And I also knew that if somebody had a sign on them and said libertarian, your chances of being hired were even less. Uh, so I knew it was not a career, at least at that point in time. And it, it later wasn't the case, but that's five or so years later, if you were a libertarian, you could get hired. But back then, no. So uh, one of my friends back in the States was hired by Merrill Lynch to be a trainee futures broker. And he said, come on in, the water's fine. Uh, so uh, ha having a pro-gold bias, uh, an intellectual bias for gold, uh, based on political philosophy. Uh, we went back, Janet and I went back to the States, and I was hired in early 1975 by E.F. Hutton's commodity headquarters in New York, down in Battery Park where I apprenticed under the head of the department, who was also at the time the chairman of the COMEX. COMEX is the Commodity Exchange of New York, where gold was first traded in the first day of January 1975, again, thanks to Mr. Blanchard. Um, I stayed a futures broker up through 1992, but in the mid-1980s, as uh, Joe mentioned, I began developing my own technical methodology, but it was a methodology that did not fit with what we called then, what was then called, or today is called, technical analysis. So it doesn't, it's not price chart, look at a price charts and draw in lines. Uh, it's a different methodology. 
And in its primitive forms, in 1987, I caught the crash. I was a futures broker at the time, made money in my own account, and my customers did as well. And at that point, it, of course, I slapped myself in the face realizing I need to work on this. Uh, so I spent the next couple of years developing the methodology more thoroughly. In 1992, a major bank had learned about my research. I'd met with them, and they were interested in buying my research. So I ceased being a broker and went into research. Uh, and I sold my research to financial firms, mutual funds, hedge funds, financial planners. And later in 2015, we opened up to retail subscribers. A final comment on our work, I'm not going to get into the methodology, OK? Uh, MSA's work has been highly accurate. Um, we've called every single major stock, stock market top and bottom since our inception. Some of them we called within the week. More generally, we called them within 5 to 7% of the actual high or low. So our accuracy is very good. And so I say that for a reason. It's not to solicit subscribers, please. It's to give you a sense of the reason that I am methodologically convinced that the coming year is going to look and probably be cataclysmic to most people. Uh, and therefore, provide you with a sense of you know, why I feel why you should give some credibility to my comments. Uh, this is also a time that I'm forecasting that if Murray were here and Ayn Rand were here, they would both smile over the events that are coming over the next year or two. We're entering part three of Atlas Shrugged in terms of real world. What I'm going to say now, what we're going to look at now, are, are some fragmented ideas. And I'm not just going to focus on markets, the stock market. Uh, but. Uh, we don't use these kind of metrics. Some, some market analysts and so forth like to look at Fed metrics, like what's the rate of interest, uh, what's them two look like, and all that stuff. What's unemployment, all these data points. This is one metric that is kind of interesting, and it, 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 said, it makes a statement. These are Fed funds rates, the rates that are controlled by the Federal Reserve. You go back to 1960. And as you can see, at point number one is when I found that MSA, that's the early 90s. And rates had been collapsing, and they stayed there for about three years. And this is from years uh, 1992 through 1994. Rates were at 3%, the lowest they'd been in 25 years. What followed was the dot-com bubble. Not that it wasn't justified on its own merits, but money flowed. They filled up the tank then. The Fed filled up your tank, and the market took off in, in subsequent years through 95 through 2000 and produced what we now call in hindsight the dot-com bubble. The second point there is period number two in 2000 through 2000, 2002 to 2005. Actually, they began cutting rates. The market topped in 2000 in price, stock market. They started cutting rates in January 2001 aggressively, right just off the market top. They cut rates to the bone by 2002 and kept them low through about two, early 2005. Those were the lowest rates. Price of money was the lowest it had ever been in 40 years. What followed was a, a major stock market boom, uh, S&P, NASDAQ 100, but also the real estate bubble followed that. No chart of that here. And obviously when that broke, that was personal painful to many people. Now, the final one, it's almost unbelievable. Uh, during 2008, they cu started cutting rates during the bear market. And they kept rates at theoretical zero from 2008 to 2022. Now, there was one blip up there in the late, that was 2018, 19, I think it was. They took it up to about 2.4, and it quickly yanked it back down again. So they not only filled the gas tank for years in the first phase at zero rates, they came back and filled it again to keep it going. And sure enough, stock market took off again. You know, from that, that was the COVID period. Uh, and they, uh, the Fed was even being, buying the ETFs themselves. They didn't just liquefy the situation. They were in there buyers just like the Bank of Japan did. Uh, now let's look at the markets at that time after each of these periods of f tank filling. Uh, top chart is the period from... Uh, 1994 to 2000, that was a triple and a half for the S&P in terms of price gain 
over the span of those uh, five or six years. And again, this is the movement and, and largely led by dot-com stocks late in, in the movement, internet. And of course, as we, if you recall, of course many of you don't, but in the year 2000, the argument was, it's gonna change your life. The internet is gonna change your life. And you know what, they were dead right. They were more right than they could even imagine. And yet the dot-com bubble burst and dropped 82%. The NASDAQ 100 went down 82%. It was primarily filled with those type of stocks. S&P only went down 50%. The chart below is uh, from uh, 2002. Again, this is after the bear market that came from the 2000 top to the 2002 low. They cut rates all the way down. And they kept rates low between 2002 and 2003. And finally, they filled the tank enough, and there it went again. This was the bubble that was not shown here, but is the real estate bubble that was associated with this. Uh, I think Alan Greenspan can take some good credit, but Bernanke came in later. Uh, no, this is the Bernanke event, yeah. Um, there's an arrow in both of those charts. On the top chart, you'll see there's an arrow a couple months after the price high. That arrow notes the point where the Federal Reserve began cutting interest rates. They cut rates by a half percent then. So now if you're in the stock market back then, and the, we called the top in January of 2000, and it labored for the next year up there, floundered around, felt good. In fact, there was a Wall Street Journal article published in 2000 that coined the phrase soft landing, which is commonly used today, meaning no worries, mate, okay? The Fed cut rates at that dark arrow up there. In first day of January 2001, they cut rates all the way down. Did the market? Benefit from that? No. It was a, the bubble was simply too big at that point. The Fed could not stop the breakage of their own bubble. They created it. They couldn't stop it once it broke. Same thing happened in 2007. Second month before the high, it's September of 2007 where the arrow is. Mid-month that month, the Fed, despite Bernanke saying there's no real estate crisis, he cut rates by a half a point. The S&P rallied for the next month into October, so another four weeks of joy. Oh, but the Fed cut rates, great. Did that work? No, no, okay. So when the Fed cut rates, don't, you know, don't be happy. It's not good news. They cut rates all the way down, market collapse anyway. Once they create the monster, when the monster comes undone, reality takes over. There is a reality out there. The Fed is not reality. Current situation. Now, we saw how they filled the tank for multiple years the first time, and then in 2018, they raised rates briefly. When the COVID event came, they filled the tank again. So now we have a bull market that is 15 years old, like triple the age of any prior bull market in U.S. history, and it's an 18-fold gain, whereas most of the prior bull markets were doubles to triples the, the one in 2000, uh, 2000 was like three and a half fold, I think. But nothing compared in dimensionality of the advance, nor in the duration of the advance that followed their monetary creation and their free money. So we have the biggest bubble in the stock market history, far bigger than even the 29 bubble, which was also monetarily stimulated. Read Rothbard's Great Depression book. He discusses the uh, in, increase in the M2 back then. Uh, when this beast breaks, and we think it's already essentially top, by the way, we think this residue new high that the NASDAQ 100 has made, that you see the last price action there, these are monthly bars. It's taken out the old high of 2022 by a handful of percentage points. Most stock market metrics have not taken out the 2022 high. The reason the NASDAQ has and the S&P has is there's about five symbols in the front end of the indexes that have enormous weighting in the indexes. So you can take the, the S&P 490, and they, they don't look like the S&P 5 front-end 5 stocks. So to some extent, this is distorted price reality. The chart below, and I'm not going to get into it, this is our method of looking at things, is a momentum chart where we measure the price action in its oscillator relationship to the three-year moving average of the index. And to some extent, therefore, we back out the distortions that are caused by the money unit. Because when you look at price of anything, loaf of bread or anything, it's you know how many money units to buy it. Well, loaf of bread when I was a kid was 20 cents. You know, now we must have a wheat shortage, right? Okay, no, 
which is the monetary degradation. So over the last, since 1960, the M2, for example, has basically doubled every decade, almost. Well, it doesn't matter which decade you pick. So if you bought a stock in 1960 and 1970, it's twice its price. Are you making money? No, not really. You break even. So anyway, a lot of this is price action that we look at is distorted by the money unit you use, whether it's the yen or the euro. In our case, it's the dollar. And given its distortion over time, price is distorted over time. You can't totally separate market analysis from the price, but if you put it in a momentum scale, it factors in more the movement of the underlying asset category. It's dynamics, whether it's lazy or strong. And to some extent, it backs out the distortions caused by the money unit, not totally. Well, if you look at the bottom chart, and if that were a price chart, would you want to buy that thing? No, it broke the integrity of a 15-year uptrend channel, perfectly parallel. It broke it in early 2022 is when it came down through that lower red line and blew, blew the structure. And for the last two years of rebound, that's what the momentum action looks like. Okay. So don't be so happy and cheery about the stock market. One, we know the Fed, when they do finally change policy, and they've already said they're going to cut three times this year, uh, even before they get to their, their inflation number that they're hoping to get to, uh, they're still going to cut. So they've comforted the market. So you're getting a little party right now in the market. But momentum says, uh-uh, you're already broken. Don't trust me. So when momentum does this and price doesn't, believe momentum. It's the one that will win out. Off the markets now. Another thing people are looking at today in terms of, you know, what's reality out there are data points. You know, we, we, everybody watches them on CNBC or whatever, you know, the employment numbers and so forth. Like how, how good is the economy? Uh, because it affects your life, whether you're in the stock market or not. Uh, like the recent unemployment reports have all been, you know, touted by the administration about how, oh, boy, our employment's just great, the best in decades, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But when you look inside the report, which most people don't, you find that the new job gains, aside from being mostly part-time as opposed to full-time, are in areas like retail, restaurants, home health care workers, and especially government hiring. Not in the main things of the, you know, the economy, the core economic areas. So the reality even that they put out is not quite what it really is. The notion of a soft landing, I think, is therefore, uh, when these markets break, we know what happened in 2008 and 9. It didn't just affect stock people. It affected everybody in the street. Unemployment went crazy. Big firms went under and so forth. So there's a real reality out there above and beyond the stock market. So even though we look at the stock market, when you create a bubble as big as this one, when this breaks, the pain will, it'll make 2009 look like nothing. Why? Because over the period of that time, when an M2 went up and when rates were free, people make decisions. You make a decision, small businesses, big businesses, state governments, municipal. And of the... the Factors that you use in making a decision or a commitment to some project, it's the cost of money. And if you're given an injection that tells you the cost of money is free and you believe it, you're delusional. But a lot of people got delusional because it lasted for so long. And therefore, the number of errors committed over a three- to five-year bubble, where the market only doubled or tripled, is one thing. But when you have a bubble this size and this old, the amount of delusional errors that have been made on a micro level and a macro level are, must be enormous. Now, we'll start to see them when the market breaks, because usually the market, the stock market, usually will start to trigger the data points. They don't lead the market down. The market leads the data points down. And at that point, you'll start to hear stories, uh, not just about regional banks or something that are supposedly under control, but other, other problems. So that's a reality that we're going to face and the statists are going to face. Um, there'll be consequences to this that are unusual this time. Uh, we've had, since the last hundred years, politics has been contested back and forth, but it's always, you know, a couple, a couple terms of Republicans control, a couple terms of Democrats control, and yet, you know, everything's copacetic. There are no fist fights on the floor or anything like that. Um, this time it's going to be different because, one, when that pain hits, and it'll hit, and it'll probably hit quickly because this market's ready to go. And when it goes, you'll feel the pain. 
The politics are, are not going to end copacetically. We've been arguing for well over a year this 2024 election is not going to be copacetic no matter who wins. And I don't want to say it's going to be violent, but I wouldn't be shocked. There was a poll taken by the University of Virginia Department of Politics that was released in October last year. Uh, and they surveyed both Biden, likely Biden, and likely Trump voters. These are some of their conclusions. A staggering majority of both Biden, 70% of his voters, and Trump likely voters, 68%, believed that selecting, uh, electing officials from the opposite party would result in lasting harm to the United States. Other observation. Roughly half, 52% of Biden voters, 47% of Trump voters, viewed those who supported the other party as threats to the American way of life. Next question. About 40% of both groups, 41% of the Biden voters, 38% of the Trump voters, at least somewhat believed that the other side had become so extreme that it's acceptable to use violence to prevent them from achieving their goals. Final observation, again quoting them. A significant share of respondents also expressed doubts about both the future of democracy and even the United States as, as it is currently composed. It's an issue that Mises Institute's been talking about for many, many months, secession. Roughly two in five, 41% of respondents that leaned toward Trump in 2024, at least somewhat agreed with the idea of red states seceding from the union to form their own separate country while 30% of Biden voters expressed a similar sentiment, but for blue states. These are incredible numbers, it's not 5%. Okay. Disturbingly, nearly one third, 31% of Trump voters and about one quarter of Biden voters at least somewhat agree that democracy is no longer a viable system and that the country should explore alternative forms of government to ensure stability and progress. It's gonna be a very interesting year because all these pieces are gonna to fit together, domino into one domino into another domino. And I don't think it's gonna be incrementalism. It, uh, we normally have incremental trends in the economy and, and in stock markets even. We don't have an incremental trend now. I think we're about to enter what the chaos theorist would love. You suddenly go from arm wrestling to sudden drama and things suddenly break and you wonder why. Again, we're in part three of Atlas Shrugged, remember when everything came undone. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain. <laughs> Dr. Oliver, thank you so much for, for your lecture. Uh, I have a question on what to do. Do you think uh, right now we should uh, have a, like a barbaro strategy, uh, a store of value? What, what is your take on gold and Bitcoin oh, yeah, to protect yeah, us no, for, no, from this bubble? Gold is, a, gold is a smart metal. You know, everybody looks at markets. S&P has been around since the 1950s. T-Bond's been around, what, 100 years or so. The Fed's only been around a century. So these aren't like some historic institutions. That, you know, gold's been around 3,000 years, okay? And people have survived holding gold through all kinds of hell. You know, collapses of governments, wars, and everything. Uh, if you came from another planet, landed somewhere in Africa, and, and wanted to exchange with gold, there'd be people to accept it. If you land in Europe, gold is, is, is money, okay? So, and it's also, you know, they can't expand its quantity. So ultimately, yes, that's why there's demand for gold. Uh, and gold's been behaving quite well. You know, it's been it doubled from 2015 to 2020. Then it went into a three-year range, effectively. It only had a 20% drop during that range, actually. Now it's making new highs. And yet there's no headline to explain why. Well, the reason is it knows what's coming and it knows what the central banks are gonna do when that stuff happens. They're gonna go nuts, they have to go nuts. That's their job. They'll have to buy assets, they'll have to liquefy the system, no matter what they claim academically now. But if that stuff starts to come apart, they're gonna unite and have a unified policy across Japan, Europe, and here to again, liquefy the system whatever means they have, and therefore your money unit's going to decay. Uh, ours and theirs, you know, it's, it, people talk about the dollar as such, you know. We think the dollar is going to get weak as well during this period. Uh, we, 
technical analysis suggests to us a major downturn, another downturn in the dollar is about to happen. But that's really not the factor. It's all the currencies are decaying in real value. Yeah. Bitcoin, you have it. Yeah. Is, is Bitcoin sort of value? Uh, we've analyzed Bitcoin since its inception and been quoted in the Wall Street Journal by, by it as well. And we've, all our calls have been good, but and we got bullish in the high 20s, 20,000s, uh, 2022 was down there. We got bearish at 55,000 when it was coming off its top. And right now we're still bullish, but um, in terms of its sustainability, it, it, it doesn't have certain virtues that gold has, aside from heritage. Um, it's accessible, it's on computers, you know, the government can access it. And I think once people, become more distrustful of the state because of events that happen in their lives that hurt them. Uh, that, that's going to be a negative for Bitcoin because it's, it is accessible. And the government already has tried to come down on it in various ways. You know, it's used to launder money, uh, you know, all these excuses they had. Recently, they did a study on whether it's t too much energy consumption, you know. Uh, so if, if they have to, let's say Bitcoin became a useful currency by 10% of the population used it in everyday purchases. In fact, if you go on Google, you can find many major name stores that will accept Bitcoin. But if it ever became 10% of the day-to-day -day transactions, central bank, that's a threat. That undermines the potency of their control of the money in it. So, you know, they take martial law steps. So it's, that's a negative, I think, down the road for Bitcoin. Um, you mentioned in your lecture that the Fed takes, you know, oh, somebody mentioned in the lecture, the Fed is entrepreneurial, right? The Fed, when these crashes come, when, when, the, when, when you know, reality hits in the face, they take unprecedented, unprecedented measures, like, you know, paying interest on commercial deposits, for example. That's what, that was one example brought up. Now, when this crash ha happens, because, you know, it'll probably happen, um, do you think, do you have any, I guess, do you any prognosis for what these measures will be? And additionally, normally, like when you see when, when these tough times time, tough times hit, people flock to more what they consider to be more secure assets, right? Like they even flock to real uh, real dollars, you know, they flock, they, flock, they flock to USD or gold or etc. And so, uh, say the say the measure they take is by buying more corporate bonds, buying ETFs directly, buying stocks directly. Do you think that if they do that and they properly value these assets, uh, and simultaneously people are flocking to more secure assets, what do you think uh, such a situation would look like if that happens? Well, in terms of asset categories that we favor now, the commodities, we, we call it a commodity bottom in October 2020. Commodities had gone down while gold doubled in price from 2015 to 2020. Commodities continued to erode. Bloomberg Commodity Index, for example, got down under 60 in price. And, and then it doubled to 140 by the time the war began in Ukraine and Russia. It didn't go up because of the war. It topped when the war started, okay? It had doubled. But even now, it's back around the 100 level. We're talking an index of commodity prices. You compare the current Bloomberg commodity price at 100 to its peak in 2008, which was 235. And then there was a peak in 2011, it was 170 something. So people who claim there's a commodity inflation, it's off the page, commodities are still vastly undervalued. We have technical reason to argue we think Bloomberg commodity index is about to move up now in sync with gold this time. And so we're, facing a situation that technically looks and fundamentally looks very much like the late 70s when the stock market became a wasteland after having crashed in 74. In 1982, the stock market was total wasteland. You couldn't make any money unless you were lucky. Commodities boomed and gold boomed. Uh, and by the way, that was despite Fed raising rates during that time, which is interesting. So I think that's the, you want to go into real assets, things like farmland, grains, um, particularly grains this time, we think. Uh, energy was a leader in that first move up. Uh, I think grains are like, which hurts, food. That's just what government wants to hear, that food prices, you know, wheat's going up. Uh, that creates personal pain. Again, you know, helps add to the chaos. Uh, but gold will lead it. We also think silver and the gold miners are a better place to be than gold at this point, because they're vastly undervalued. But, uh, okay. 
So I'm curious, based on that wonderful interview with Rothbard, he didn't seem super confident in the Libertarian Party at the beginning. beginning. And from yeah, and from that letter, it yeah. seemed to indicate you may have not have been so confident in it. What are your thoughts on third parties and independent candidates going into like 2024 with the growing political tensions? The ultimate outcome may not be a political party, but yeah, he did change because the movement changed. Uh, Murray would be so delighted to, to be here, to look, to see the size of the audience that had been in all these rooms. Uh, he'd, be, he'd be giggling, okay? Uh, he created the movement, and back then there was none when I first met him. And uh, he later did the Rothbard Summer Seminars, I think the Mises Institute, in February 15th report, had a short video on the history of the Rothbard Summer Seminars. And I think some uh, well-known names were there, like uh, Walter Block and Joe Salerno went to those. And so Rothbard did generate the movement. So this is important, Mises Institute's important, because you need an intellectual core. You don't just need mass movement. You need an intellectual core. So when people say, these ideas suck, what works, what's, what's good, what makes sense? And th that's when they turned to the Mises Institute in, in spades. And I, he'd be delighted. You know. But as far as political, I have no opinion on viability. The LP did a service in that it did, in my early days, if you used the word libertarian, it meant you were a voluntary socialist. Bakunin was a, was a libertarian in, in academia back then. Uh, he was an interesting man, but he wasn't an anarcho-capitalist. Uh, but it was only when Murray Rothbard came around that, that libertarianism and the LP came around, shifted to free market totally opposite to what libertarianism meant back in the 60s. Uh, now, if you use the word libertarian, they don't think of socialist liberty, they think of something. Thank you, Sam. So you mentioned that there's, going, there's likely to be a, a large drop in the stock market and the economy as a whole. What is that going to do to student loans and universities? By, by view of student loans is once they were taken over by the government. Uh, I totally disagree with the Republicans who, who want you to pay the loans back. It's stolen money. Uh, the, my article in Defense of Pirateering was on that issue. In other words, once it's unowned money and the government rips it off from everybody, you can't trace it back to its owner. And the government's not a legitimate owner of money, so if you've got government money and don't pay it back, fine. I'll probably get arrested for that. Uh, <laughs> but no, it's not stolen money. No, it's not like taking a loan out in private. I suspect strongly that in this economic crisis, which will be associated with the stock market downturn, and there may even be a crash event in the stock market, but I'm not betting on that. They don't always occur. You get major bear, the 2000, 2002, no, no, bear, no crash, none, okay? So it doesn't always happen. But the pain that will be associated with that in terms of personal lives will, one, the student loans, they simply can't pay it. So there'll be, a, in effect, there's already talk of a tax rebellion, a, a student loan rebellion. If if Trump doesn't get elected, there'll be a tax rebellion. I almost guarantee it. There'll also be serious talk among certain states of secession, where it's already being talked about, but it's a minority sort of issue. It'll become a more popular issue if he, if he doesn't win. But as far as the, the tax issue, paying taxes uh, with student loan, and, okay. if you can't afford to pay it, you delay. And we already know that in the COVID event, they delayed tax payments for three months one of those years because people just couldn't pay. If people go into hardship, there'll, there'll be more and more delays in terms of requests for delays, loans, and so forth, to the point where the IRS will be ineffective in raising the money they're supposed to raise, in which case they'll revert to a national sales tax. I suspect that the IRS will be abolished, whether it's under Democrat win or Trump win, that ultimately there won't be an IRS they'll reserve to go to a sales tax. And even there was a Trump advisor in his administration, I think his name Steve something, who recommended a national sales tax at that time. So. All right, let's give a hand for Mr. Oliver. Thank you. Thank you.